What's up, 3DMJers? I am here with my brother from another mother, Alberto Nunez, as well as our injury reduction and management specialist, Dr. Nicholas Licamelli, DPT, and he's at his home office, and what does he have with him, folks, but a spine. And uh, we definitely didn't have him go to another room to get said spine. This is just, just a perfect occurrence for this episode where we're going to be talking about back pain. So back pain is something we've probably all experienced at least once, and we have empirical data to suggest that is definitely the case. In fact, a recent study in 2018 by Strombach and colleagues where they uh, interviewed, I believe, over 100 powerlifters, both men and women, uh, using a criteria of do you have pain or have you had to modify your training in any way, meaning uh, my shoulder hurts, I'm not doing wide grip bench, I'm doing close grip, or I'm going to squat today instead of, back, instead of deadlift because my lumbar hurts a little bit. Uh, pretty broad criteria for, for an injury, but something we've all experienced. And indeed, I think 70% of the powerlifters in this study were experiencing pain currently. So yeah, it happens a lot. Um, obviously, if you use different criteria for injury, it's far less frequent, um, but it is something that inevitably we're all going to experience. Uh, and it's also quite common in the general population, but probably a different etiology or cause uh, for us lifters. So first, I want to kick it over to you, Berto, and ask you a little bit about your personal experience. I'm thinking specifically of the pre-3DMJ days, back in 08, when you became a, a big-ass pro natural bodybuilder in multiple organizations. But little did the people know that those beautifully shredded quads on stage were actually the product of you making lemonade. And you actually, if I don't want to tell the story for you, but you had a pretty significant back injury that, that had you questioning your future with the sport. Yeah. Uh, background to, yeah, it was in the middle of a, of, a, of a prep. I was pretty far into the prep. I think man, it was at least 10 to 12 weeks in at this point. And it was in, in regards to just how my life was set up at the time. Um, man, uh, I was going to school. I was, I had two gigs. One of those gigs was overnight. So some of those days just looked funky in regards to my sleep and awake times. And then I was trying to keep up with everything else I had going on, you know? Mm. So I, I remember that day just didn't feel like a day that I should even be there, but you know, it was only my second prep. I was fairly new to this still. So I decided to go in there and Hey, those deadlifts that we had on schedule, those were going to happen. And, and yeah, there was many, many signs along the way that, you know, they were pointing at, pointing at, Hey, just, just stop here. Or at least, you know, one set of deadlifts is enough. You can, you know, probably you, you, you'll be fine, Bert, but no, I decided to continue with it. And second set, it wasn't even very heavy. Um, not for me at the time, it was somewhere in maybe the about 400 pounds 415 425 somewhere around there but yeah i heard a loud pop in my i couldn't even tell you exactly where it was i just knew it was my left side and i'm like okay well there we go we'll stop there you know this seems reasonable we'll stop there and i continued with the rest of the training session i was i was actually i, I didn't feel very different at all even got some posing in afterwards, I, I think, and went home, sat down to go hang out with my buddies on the bodybuilding.com message board forums. And uh, I think, yeah, I allowed myself an hour of like uh, just internet venturing at the time because I, I was tight on time. So after an hour of being seated, I remember I get up and I'm like, oh, I, I can't get up. And then I really tried to get up and it was some of the most intense pain I've, I've ever felt. It was radiating like down my leg, uh, that kind of pain that just, it was, it would make my face flush, even though it was the left leg. And in sections, I managed to get myself to a reasonable place to spend the night. And I, I just, I remember I had to lay on my right side, which just to get to that side was quite the adventure. I couldn't, I could barely move my leg at all. If I moved it too much, that same pain would hit. And uh, I just remember thinking to myself, well, I guess, well, this prep is over. Um, and probably not just that, but maybe I should look into a different hobby 
uh, from from now on. I just started going through the list of things in my head that I excel at. I'm like, hey, you know, we're, we're we'll pick something and we'll, we'll attack it with um, the same viciousness that we do this bodybuilding thing. Um, and you know, it, it stayed relatively the same for a few days. Um, but at some point, you know, I <laughs> I figured out that. Exactly, because I had to go feed myself. I I, I was not going to go off off plan all the way, even though I pretty much I decided that this was the end of the road. Um, so I figured out ways to move. By day four or five, I I got back in the gym, um, and it was enough to the point where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to continue with this prep. But I mean, who knows like what's going to happen from here? I'm so close. I'll at least do one show, is what I thought. Um, so long story short. Um, for the most part, I figured out what I could do and couldn't do. There wasn't a whole lot of leg training throughout that whole contest prep, but I, I think in hindsight, I did a few things right, and it was probably the right section to have such limitations imposed on because my legs hung on like pretty well. Um, but I, I remember after that prep was over, um, first of all, the healing I did from April when it happened all the way to the end of the season in August, the first month post prep, I like healed. I made more progress than I did during that whole time, basically dieting. But it didn't end there. I think the the, the I made some progress. I could walk normal. Um, I can lift, although not the way I I wanted to or the way I thought I needed to lift. And for a good two years, I'd say that just bodybuilding wasn't fun. I think one of my hardest what I remember vividly is like we'd all get together to to have these uh, lifter like just group sessions and everyone's like hitting a PR there, he, hitting a PR here. And look, I'm, I'm happy for them. But at the same time, it's like I don't even know what that feels like anymore. Um, I, I, I don't. But I stuck around simply because I was still getting something out of it. Um, I was kind of in this. It, there wasn't as many resources as, as we have now, basically everyone I did go to was kind of a quack job. And if I could pick it up like back then when I didn't know as much, then I can certainly say now in hindsight, they probably weren't the best candidate to help me. But, um, but yeah, good two years of just basically, and, and this is, and, and Nick will talk on this because I actually, I eventually approached it the right way. Two years of having no fun with this, you know, just kind of going through the motions, doing what I could. Um, I stuck around because I love bodybuilding because I was like, you know, yeah, today's going to be the day. Today's going to be the day. And most of the time I'd leave the gym like, damn, today was not the day, but we'll be back tomorrow. Um, so what I did at a certain point is I just I looked at a lot of the and this this maybe take a giant leap forward. Um Two years later, finally, I'm like, you know what? There's a lot of guys with really good physiques that are training body parts once a week. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do that. And much lower volume than I was typically using that I thought I needed at the time. And within like four months, I made enough progress where I, I found myself doing a powerlifting meet. Like, you know, I didn't feel like the same lifter um, that I was before, but I could do a powerlifting meet and do reasonably well. Um, so, so yeah. Um, and to kind of just expedite the story, I'd say now, like man, 2008, that's like 12, 13 years ago. Um, I, it, like I heard so much less and, and in regards to like the injury, uh, the last three years, I, I've had no issues with it. And I've done some pretty gnarly stuff in regards to movements that, you know, require axial loading. Um, and and a lot of it was just, for me anyways, and, and, and Nick will be able to clear this up, uh, was just being a little bit more honest with myself in regards to like what I could handle, both in regards to movements, in regards to progressions. Um, and 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 that has gone a, a long, long way. And, and now at age 38, you know, there was a point in time where I'm like, man, I'll never be the same athlete I, I was before. Um, I, I can, with a lot of confidence, say that like right now, like this is not just the best me in regards to um, just, I guess, physique and everything, but probably 
this is the least amount of, of pain I, I've been in. And like a lot of folks, I really thought the whole back thing was just going to be there with me for like the rest of my life. Like mm. it, it would, it would even five years ago, it would flare up like once a year where my left leg was just like a little numb and I was limited for a while with my training, but, uh, but here we are today. Um, and I feel good as new. And at some point I'm going to take the uh, team squat record back from, from Eric. <laughs> well, I think you, you still deserve the win for getting it first. Cause that was the bet who can get to 500 pounds first, not who can do an extra 1.5 pounds more than that <laughs> a year after you did it. So, <laughs> um, two years shit. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so I have been accused of maybe being too optimistic or having a general tendency to try to look at the bright side of things and maybe being too laid back in certain scenarios. I pale in comparison to Berto. Y'all don't know. Berto does not worry about shit. That's just not in his DNA. And uh, when he told me that he was considering, I don't know, like seated table tennis as an alternative to bodybuilding and, <laughs> and being you know, worried about it moving forward, uh, that kind of really put into perspective like, oh, how bad the, the back, back injury was. And like you said, you thought you'd never be the same. And, and that's the narrative, right? Like... Um, everything in the body heals, but not backs, you know, yeah. like, like the spine is, is, uh, it's been implanted in you and it is a mechanical device. And once it's damaged, you got to call somebody to fix it and there ain't nobody to call. So you're screwed, you know? Um, and I think, oh, actually, I'd love to know from you, Nick, as a clinician, does it seem like certain injuries and especially the back, uh, people tend to have these very different perceptions, like healing doesn't work there. It's a permanent thing discs don't heal like these are all things i've heard thought believed and felt and been afraid of in my own personal history too yeah i mean lot to unpack there uh berto thank you for sharing that story i, I think eric i'm going to answer your question but i think what i get out of berto's story is you're a different athlete because you went through that you will never be that vulnerable again you'll never be completely uh, floored by an injury like you were because you went through that and you went through the process, you had those dark thoughts and you plowed through it. You are a different athlete and a different human um, in all aspects of your life. And that is one thing that I, I, it's so hard for people to understand when they're going through injury that this moment right now is the suck, <laughs> but you will come out of this stronger. There is no, there is no other option. You're going to get better from this and you're going to look back on this and you're going to be more resilient physically and mentally. Um, so that was the one thing that really jumped out at me with, um, with your story. And yet, Eric, to answer your question, um, I, I do think that certain injuries, I don't know why, but certain injuries get more fear behind them. I, I don't know if it's because there's more they're kind of like these sexy things like rotator cuff or uh, back pain uh, versus something like, I don't know, uh, TMJ pain, like in your, in your jaw, like rotator cuff, back pain, uh, even like knee pain, like those kind of things just tend to draw people for some reason. And I think like any kind of marketing, I think there's mo more information just put out about those things because people know that they want to learn about them. Um, so I do think the, that back pain is something that is, has a lot of fear around it. Um, what we know from the research on low back pain is that, yes, it can be very intense and very uh, debilitating, like Berto said, but it's rarely something dangerous. And just to explain what I mean by that, when I say danger, I'm talking red flags. Tumors, God forbid, fractures, uh, infections, things like that. Um, rarely is it something dangerous. It is absolutely intense and, and severe and life altering, but majority of cases of low back pain will get better with time. We have evidence that shows us six weeks is a good place to start seeing some kind of improvement. Um, it's just the way mother nature works. Um, if it's 
really intense, there's something called regression to the mean, which means if we are coming in with this severe, severe back pain, the tendency is going to be to move to average. So it's going to kind of work itself out, even if we don't do anything actively to, uh, to kind of um, uh, recover from it. So basically, yes, I think there is fear around back pain. Um, I think it's probably because it could be so intense and, and maybe there's a lot of buzz terms around back pain. But the good news is that the research does show that it, it is rarely something dangerous, um, rarely needs surgery or injections or things like that. And usually with a bit of guidance and reassurance and education, um, most of cases of low back pain uh, will, will get better. Mm. No, I think that's a... That's that's I totally agree on uh, the perception and the framing of, of of Berto's experience. I'm not trying to speak for Berto, but I saw him nodding, and I, I, I that's something I relate to. I've not, I can think of a number of injuries where I've had where it's made me more resilient long term by overcoming it, not the injury itself per se. Um, and I I want to spend a little more time on the concept of regression to the mean because it's such a a critical aspect any time we're looking at uh, let's say corrective physiology. And I'm trying to use a very broad umbrella term because mm. that can apply to taking medicine, that can apply to getting a treatment for something. Um, it's It doesn't often apply to say like performance enhancement because we're trying to, you know, go above what is homeostasis to something better. Like we don't, like you don't have to worry about regression to the mean in uh, randomized controlled trials of resistance training. You don't really need a control group in my opinion because you don't regress to being more jacked, right? <laughs> Be nice if you did, um, but uh, but yeah, the whole reason we have control groups uh, and we have uh, blinding and a lot of the statistical or I should say methodological protocols we have in science. One of the reasons is to deal with regression to the mean. Here's a really simple one: um, the idea that vitamin C uh, tends to help you recover from the common cold. Um, most people recover from the common cold. <laughs> it has a very low incidence of causing you know, this, this progressive down, downward trend until you die from the common cold. So if someone simply does nothing, they will not have the cold anymore. Uh, but if they are thinking about what do I do about the cold, let me take vitamin C and they get better because we're associative animals as human beings. We're going to go, oh, I had the cold, took vitamin C, didn't have the cold. Boom, bada bing, right? Like, there we go. Um, so what we really need is a group, if we're going to compare the efficacy of vitamin C on the symptomology of the common cold, we need two groups. Uh, we need to recruit a whole bunch of people because we can't give people the cold. That's not ethical. And we need to have, you know, wait for people to get the cold. And then we watch people who get it and do nothing. And we watch people who get it and take vitamin C and see the outcome. And I think that's exactly, I, I know I went maybe a little in more in depth than we need to on that, but it's a really important thing because we have to look through the lens of understanding the regression to the mean every single time you see on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or, on a, or you listen on a podcast, someone talking about an intervention related to pain uh, or injury or treatment of anything, even when it sounds logical, even when it has a solid mechanistic underpinning, uh, because a lot of this stuff is very complex and there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, going on a hypothesis or a hunch. We do it all the time in coaching because we have limited knowledge of what we can do. And I, I know Nick, you know, operates on educated guesses all the time in his clinical practice. Sometimes, sometimes that's all you have. Um, however, we need to scale our confidence uh, of any intervention to the level of data we have on something. So if all we have is some observational anecdotes and some mechanistic underpinnings and some logic, that's great. If that's all you got, go for it. But if you want to know or you want to speak confidently on the efficacy of something, you really need to have those trials where they take that into consideration. So I will leave it there because I think that's a lot. But Nick, I'd love to kick it back over to you and start to hear about, um, you know, what are some of the common causes of lower back pain to the best of our knowledge that we know they exist and what are some of the most common treatments and, and what are some of the pitfalls as far as what are maybe our false beliefs about those causes are or some of the effic or, or some of some methods that are commonly thought to have effic efficacy which actually aren't any better than say regression to the mean yeah it's an important a very important topic i think the best way to dive into that is i guess start with 
why it's so important to to get that to get these messages out to talk about some of the common causes of something like that some of the false narratives of why something like that would happen and then clarifying some of the treatment because if we have the wrong map and we're trying to get through New York with a map of Chicago no matter how good of a driver we are no matter how great our driving skills are, or I guess that's the same thing as a good driver, um, we're not going to get to our destination, right? So we have to look through the right goggles if we're going to approach something like this. Um, so one of the things, uh, Berto, I, I would love to ask you is, did you ever feel like it was your fault? Like, did you feel like you did something wrong and like, damn, like I, mi mm. I misgrooved that deadlift or like, I should have done more core work or I should have stretched a bit more before training. Like, did you ever go through down that road of, of kind of breaking yourself down and blaming yourself for it? Yeah. But I mean, not in a super negative way. It was just like, you shouldn't have been, you should have stayed home and sleep, dude. Like it was, it was more like duh in hindsight, but uh, it was, it was never, um, I never made myself feel bad about it. I, okay. Because you know, I was, I was trying really hard. You know, so it was just like, okay, well, you know, you're out trying to get yours. Um, but, but no, no. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I think in, in hindsight, um, when I thought it was gone, like done, that was way easier than like, it's kind of there, but it doesn't want to come back all the way. And this is, this is really frustrating. And we just didn't have folks like you, Nick, like w what the landscape looked like back then. <sighs> Man, like it's kind of scary to think about it because you know you guys play a major role in educating us, keeping us healthy. But we were we were praying. We weren't even at the point where we were praying to Kelly Starrett Star yet at that point. No, I mean, that no, was, no. That was pretty <laughs> supple leopard. We we weren't slamming uh, things into flesh, you know, because you know that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's that's we weren't we weren't flossing <laughs> just just our teeth like idiots, you know. <laughs> to, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, no, okay. Yeah. So I, I think what I see a lot is people shaming themselves or, or blaming things on themselves because of some kind of false narrative that they have about why this pain developed. One of the things that I want everyone to listen to, if you are dealing with low back pain or know someone who's dealing with low back pain, is this stuff just happens sometimes. <laughs> there is nothing that you could have done to prevent it. Sometimes it just happens. Um, and pain is a normal thing. We feel pain throughout our lives. We feel hunger. We feel thirst. Majority of people are going to have some kind of lower back pain in their lives, um, not necessarily because they did something wrong. So some of the the narratives that I hear when it comes to low back pain are um, something like a, a, a weak core, for example. Um, I, I'm not really sure how that that narrative started, but the idea is that if we can strengthen the muscles around our spine, then we can better support this Jenga stack that our spine is with our core muscle, uh, core muscles. Makes sense, sort of, if you think about it. Um, but what we find is that that's not exactly true. We haven't seen that in, in the research where if we... Um, overly contract our core muscles, that that's somehow protective uh, in our spine or that specific core exercises like planks, for example, that they can be protective against low back pain. Um, so having that narrative can lead you down a road of strengthening your core and doing a bit too much of that kind of training because you're trying to prevent back pain. Um, when, uh, those things may have their place. So if we're recovering from low back pain and we can't tolerate a squat, we can't tolerate a deadlift, but we need to get some kind of load and co-contraction in that area just to kind of desensitize that whole area of your body. Planks, bridges, those things have their place. So I'm not saying that core strengthening is, you know, should never be used. I think if we use it correctly, um, as a low level way to load our spines and 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 the pelvis uh, pelvic area, I think that that's probably the best way to use something like that. Um, I think posture is another big misconception that 
that um, that I hear in my practice is uh, someone coming in with low back pain, and they'll say, "Well, I sit all day at work, and sitting is the new smoking." Or, or I um, when I when I bend over when I when I deadlift, I round my back a bit, and, and the posture of my back is the reason why why I have back pain. Um, again, makes sense uh, if you think about it. Uh, we have this this spine where we have a stack of bones with with discs in between them and the spinal cord runs through it so if we bend it and and load it and sit for a long time why wouldn't it uh, why wouldn't we develop some pain um what we're finding is that's not exactly true and when it comes to posture uh we'll take sitting posture since that's kind of what i use as an example sitting is no worse or better than standing uh the most important thing is that we move out of different postures um, so if you sit for your job, stand up for a little bit, go take a walk. Um, but, but, but sitting with a rounded back is not something that we have seen to, to contribute to, uh, to low back pain. Hey guys, this is Andrea Valdez here to tell you that we just launched the Vault VIP membership. You can now get access to every single course we've ever made for just $8.99 per month for a limited time at 3dmjvault.com. Until recently, you could only purchase one course at a time at the full price, which currently can cost up to $63. But now, with this new VIP membership, you can have full access to everything we've ever made for one low monthly rate. That means you can watch all the videos and get all the document downloads for courses like the Lifting Library, Transitioning Away from Tracking, The Godfather's Guide to Posing, our full fat loss Q&A series, and so much more. Again, that's all 12 video courses for only $8.99 per month for a limited time. As with everything we make in the vault, the price will increase as we add more courses and content over time, so the sooner you subscribe, the more money you'll save. Go to 3dmjvault.com, select the VIP membership, and sign yourself up today. How people get caught up in these narratives, um, I don't think it is, like to talk about the psychology a little bit, some of it is just exposure to these false narratives for sure. But I think no one likes to hear there's nothing you could have done to prevent this injury. Mm -hmm. um, because I'll, I'll speak for myself, even someone who is <laughs> obviously super entrenched in like empirical and rational thought and is very naturally skeptical, um, I will cling to some of these narratives and stories because I'm also someone who is very uh, focused on like self-discipline and my ability to, to have self-efficacy and change things in my life. Um, so like I have knee-jerk negative reactions towards like determinism or anything that, that, that makes me feel like I don't have any agency in a given situation. So... I am definitely one where I look for something I could have done or can do in the future because what is scarier than anything is to be like, yeah, sometimes you're going to get hurt, can't do shit about it, you don't know the severity of it, and and uh, there's no solution. And everything, all these little things you're doing, you're just praying to false idols, you know, and it's just your banky. Your core exercises are your banky. This is your banky, you know. Um, that's not a fun message to hear. Um and I do want to say from a, again, from an empirical perspective as, as a scientist, I think there is a big difference between there is no cause for these things versus the causes are so complex, multifactorial, and we don't have the tools to know them, that it is almost impossible, not in all cases, but in many cases, to isolate it down to one thing. But it is definitely impossible to go on Instagram and give a one-size-fits-all answer to all <laughs> injuries to a given region. Um, which is, I think, unfortunately, what we see a lot of the time and where these narratives stem from. So, yeah. And I think, so this is one of those things, people who follow my content will be pretty aware, whether I've said it explicitly or not, that I'm not a huge fan of making leaps without data, even when they seem logical. And that's something we do, we've done a lot traditionally in, in bodybuilding, strength and conditioning and resistance training. Like, oh, if this does this, then therefore this does this, therefore we should do that. And you can get these very complex periodization schemes. You can get very complex, quote unquote, rules that were originally grounded in something that was scientific of what you have to do. And then you get these camps who argue. 
Um, while exercise science has progressed because it's a little easier just to measure, did you get bigger or stronger after we did X or Y program? I think it's a lot harder to do that in the, uh, the injury recovery world. And it's really interesting, Nick, as an outsider, someone who's in science, to observe people who are clinging to kind of the old school of injury treatment of there, I mean, God, the, the number of assumptions and steps that are all scientifically grounded that lead to some of these treatment things are astounding to me. Like I think back when I did my NASM certified personal trainer and clin clinical exercise specialist certification about 10 years ago, and you have to go, all right, so first we have to understand uh, synergistic dominance, and then we have to understand that tight muscles pull on things and weak muscles don't. And if we balance them, and then we have to train this one, and then we have to move in the same planar motions, and then eventually you get to this thing where you can connect any injury to anything, and this is always this, or this, this anything can be the solution. But we had, but it was all very, very light on the actual applied studies of we compared this intervention to this intervention. So, yeah, I just, uh, I don't envy kind of the, um, the internal war that's going on in the physical therapy and, and injury treatment world where it is so difficult, where, or like, because people can say something that is grounded in physiology and they haven't made up anything false, but, and, and, and the outcome when you tell them, hey, we don't have any data to support that, it always comes back to, you know, well, we just need to modulate dose. And maybe that is all we have at this at this at this stage, but it's I think that's a really difficult thing for people to wrap their heads around, both clinicians and people who are looking for things to do and to feel like they have self-efficacy to prevent injuries in the future. So anyway, long aside, but I'll leave it there and you carry on. Mike's back to you. No, yeah, thank you for that, because that's definitely what you said. That is what I wanted to say. And that's the message I wanted to get across is is not that sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. And then like, you can't learn from it. And how do I prevent it? And, oh my God, it's going to happen again. Um, but just like you said, it's, it's multifactorial. There's all these moving pieces that make it nearly impossible to prevent. Um, mm. It's not like if you don't change your oil in your car, your engine's going to break down. Okay. Change your oil every couple of miles. You're good to go. This has a bit, uh, a bit more nuance, uh, nuance to it. Um, I think I, I should possibly talk about my experience with some back pain and some nerve symptoms before I was in physical therapy school um, because I have, I have that perspective and I, I've been down that road and, and have, uh, have, have not gotten uh, where I wanted to go following kind of some, uh, some wrong paths that I thought were true at the time. And I would even say in physical therapy school, it almost heightened all those things because you're just thrown all of this information and it's a very bio medical, uh, approach, uh, in PT school. No, no fault of the PT school. They have to teach what they have to teach. So we pass our exams and, and everything like that, but it, it is a very much, uh, very mechanical approach. So, um, it's almost every, every step you take, you're judging from your great toe to your ankle pronation to your knee to your hip to your low back and it's like you're this fragile being uh in, in pt school um so i was i was prepping in 2014 and i was in my beginning my last year of pt school and i started developing some mild back pain but mostly it was nerve symptoms into my leg and it got worse with um, inclined treadmill walking, which I was doing for my main cardio at the time. Prolonged standing. So if I was standing at work for, um, you know, uh, 10 minutes, I would have to move or I'd have to change my position or I'd have to slouch my back a little bit because I would start feeling that that dull, achy pain into my leg. Um, actually, maybe we should stop there and just talk a bit about why that happens. I don't know if everyone is aware of like the actual anatomy of the spine. So just a quick, a quick aside, um, basically your spine. Quick, in quick, quick request. Yeah. Can you show us maybe with a visual example? <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So when you look at a spine and I happen to have one right here, <laughs> uh, you could think of it. And this explanation is going to be very much structural. But keep in mind that, like we said, injury is not always this cut and dry. So we have this, this stack of, of vertebrae, 
and which are the bones, and then the discs sit in between them. The discs have gotten this reputation of being these jelly donuts. <laughs> I don't know what it is about a jelly donut, <laughs> but they're anything but a jelly donut. Uh, unless we're talking like a very, very stale, stable jelly donut. <laughs> uh, these things are pretty darn uh, resilient. Um, but you could think of it as they're a bit harder on the outside and have some fluid on the inside. Um, and they allow for some cushioning in between the vertebrae and allow us to, our spines to move. Behind and kind of through this whole stack, think of it like a stack of toilet paper with the hole going down the middle, you have the spinal cord starts in your brain, goes down your spine. Um, and at each level, if you could see here, if you're on YouTube, the each level of the spine has uh, holes and the spinal cord branches out and goes, uh, nerves leave the spinal cord and go into your arms, into your legs and the rest of your body. So what can happen is, uh, so why why do you get nerve pain down your leg if you have back pain? Nerves are like wires. Or, or a garden hose, for example. And if you have a kink in the wire or if you step on the garden hose, you're going to impact what happens down the road. Your spine is basically a circuit breaker box for the rest of your body. So each segment of your spine is going to correlate to a certain part of your of your body. So we'll use the low back, for example. Um, certain levels of your spine are going to innervate your great toe, your, your big toe. Certain ones are going to innervate your heel. Certain ones are going to innervate your inner thigh, the back of your leg, your butt area. Um, so just like if you blow a fuse in your house and your kitchen lights go out, you're going to go down to your breaker, flip the correct switch that correlates to your kitchen lights. Um, and you're not going to necessarily change the bulb in your kitchen light, in your kitchen, right? You're going to go down to the source. So that's why sometimes, and we'll, I guess, get to this, but um, we don't necessarily want to uh, foam roll the muscle that hurts or work on the muscle that's painful because maybe the source is back in the circuit breaker box. Um, so just a quick review of the anatomy and and why is some people may be saying, why the heck does my leg feel numb when I misgroove the deadlift? It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so that's kind of why that you get kind of those symptoms. So I'm going to hang up the spine for now. Um, so back to my story, I was getting that nerve pain quite frequently and I was having thoughts that if I am at the time I was maybe 12, 24, I said, if I'm 24 years old and I'm getting numbness and tingling in my leg, what am I going to look like when I'm 30? What am I going to look like when I'm 40? Am I going to be that guy that you just see walking down the street with that limp and you're like, I wonder if he was in Vietnam. I wonder if like he had a stroke. I being active and being an athlete and being in shape is, was, and still is part of my identity. And I, I value that. And I thought that was going to be threatened because I was this young and having this severe pain. Um, what I was doing to treat it was stretching my hamstrings because naturally the sensation was in the back of my leg. So I said, well, if something feels tight and painful, I have to stretch it. So I was stretching my hamstrings. I was doing a lot of core work, uh, planks, side planks. Uh, I was doing a lot of thoracic mobility. I was doing a lot of thoracic rotation type movements um, and continuing to walk and prep and cut weight and, and continue to train. Fast forward, um, to when I started seeing some changes, um, I basically stopped doing everything that I was doing, uh, as far as ways to try to treat it. What I realized was one of the things that kept provoking it was the incline treadmill walking, because if you imagine watching someone on an incline treadmill from the side, uh, they're basically kind of leaning forward with their upper body. And when they move their foot forward and pull their foot up and their toes up and strike with their heel, you're basically pulling on your entire sciatic nerve with every step. So I kept doing that over and over and over again. Um, I kept stretching my hamstrings, which I was actually stretching my sciatic nerve <laughs> because that that tightness back there uh, it feels like muscle tightness, but it is 
nerve pain and we don't want to stretch nerve pain. So it's important to make sure if you're going to stretch for low back pain, you get checked out by a qualified healthcare provider and make sure that what you're stretching is the structures that you want to stretch. We want to stretch contractile tissue if you're going to stretch at all, not an inflamed nerve. <laughs> um, so anyway, long story short, even though it was, it was a long story, so I guess long story long, um, I had to change my, my paradigm that I was approaching my condition to. I had to realize that what I was doing was not working. And I realized that the tools that I was throwing at it were actually making it feel worse. So it wasn't until I changed my perspective and learned a bit more about back pain that I started seeing results. I'm 31 now. I haven't had pain in, uh, I can't even remember the last time I had any kind of sensation down my leg just because I've modified what I was doing. Granted, I'm not prepping. <laughs> so that that throws that in there too. Um, and I guess that's also a good time to mention how much stress and, and, and um, being in a caloric deficit and training hard and those things can, can contribute to those kind of symptoms. So I um, just wanted to share my story and how I don't want to sound like I've never made a mistake in in approaching my own body or my own pain. And uh, so I do know what it's like. And that is one of the reasons, very similar to all of our journeys in bodybuilding, one of the reasons why we exist and one of the reasons why 3DMJ exists is to prevent people from making the same mistakes that we did when we were younger and when we were getting into this game. That is why I exist because I don't want people to have to go to Dr. Google or go to someone on social media to find out how to fix this ripping pain down their leg or draw conclusions about this ripping pain down their leg and think that they'll never be able to run and play with their child someday. And I can assure you, I run and play with my daughters all the time. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, th that's my story. I think it's helpful to under to kind of walk through my own mindset and how I've kind of changed a bit um, and, and a bit of the why behind uh, why I, I exist. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's incredibly valuable. I think that's really good perspective. And I love the way you worded all of that. Um, I like also that you talked about, and so did you, Berto, earlier, the, the timing of this occurrence and some of the potential, what I would call moderators, to when you're at a, maybe a greater risk of developing back pain. Um, I think of every time I've torn my hamstring, that's probably more related to the fact that I was running and which I do during contest prep. So that's more <laughs> like a covariate, but I, I definitely have experienced more injuries while dieting in my personal history than I have when not, which speaks more broadly to just our overall, you know, work and recovery balance. Um, so Berto, you at this stage have, have coached far more athletes than I have. We're looking at over a decade of, of working with a full roster now. Um, talk to me about what you've observed just when your athletes get hurt. When does it tend to happen? Um, is the recovery any different when we're looking at off-season based injuries or uh, in-season based injuries? Is it different for your powerlifters versus your bodybuilders? What kind of anecdotes you got for us? Because those are the, the highest form of evidence, at least on the internet. <laughs> Okay. Um, I will say this, usually relative to what they experienced before we worked together, like we've been able to like cut down on the occurrences of new things or things that they have history with, which to me is like a terrific sign. And it kind of tells me what they were up to, what they were doing, you know, probably very similar to myself where, you know, like sometimes there's a difference. Often there's a difference with really hardworking bodybuilders between like what you're really, what you're willing to do versus like what you should actually be doing. So a coach, very often that's, that's, that's what you do. You know, it's like you, you keep people from, I guess the equivalent of crash dieting on the training side is, is mm. one of the, the big interventions that, that we do. So, um, so right away, you know, I think just having a coach, like a good solid coach is, is going to help you immensely with that. Um, I'd say probably one of the um, yeah one of the the biggest game changers uh, for me has been just trying to perhaps lean a little bit more on what we 
can do outside of the gym. And this is a comparison that I use for them. It's like, hey, you look at the genetic freaks, like why are they so different? It's because once they leave the gym, it's like their body just gets like carried away with like the whole adaptation process. So it's like, what can we do to be, you know, more, you know, we can't, we, we, you know, we all have our limits, but what can we do to maximize ourselves outside of the gym? And to me, one of the biggest ones has been like the sleep deprivation. It's been, you know, the being streaky with your eating, all the, the stress management, all these things that I, you know, when you manage, like, you gain as efficiently and predictably as possible also help when it comes to injury prevention. Um, so, so yeah, very often it's like, Hey, I would give people an amount of work that they're not totally comfortable with. They're not completely sold on. Um, because it's too little. Yeah. Because it's too little. And I have them focus more so on the stuff outside Quarter, of the gym quote. and man, oddly enough, it's like, Hey, a lot of their flare ups, a lot of the things that they've been kind of, dealing with, you know, that just, just kind of comes with, you know, being an athlete that really wants to push the limit. Right. Um, <clears throat> those things really, really, um, yeah, they that we're, we're better able to control those. And I'd say another one is, <clears throat> has been the whole, there's no movements you have to do, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that's been a big one for, for bodybuilders. Like there was a point in time where, you know, when I first got hurt, it's like, man, I won't be able to do like those like T-bar rows in the corner that like every bodybuilder with an awesome back does, you know, besides the fact that I think it's kind of a crappy movement. Um, it's like, like you don't have to, like there's many other things you, you can do. And I think once you've really sold on that idea and you see it actually manifest into something from um, a muscularity standpoint, that's quite liberating. And like, now it's like, this has been the biggest thing for me. Like when something hurts now, it's like, all right, you know, it's like we can back it back down and build it back up if we want to, or we can just go do something else that doesn't bother the area at all. And man, like that has saved my, my saved my butt a bunch of times. And the same thing with, with my athletes. So, um, so yeah, um, I guess being efficient, how we try to be when it comes to dieting, applying that to the training principles is, is, or how, how much I load an athlete with, uh, has, has helped immensely. But the biggest things, man, sleep, stress, all those other things that like, if I'm really stressed, like I'll have a very good training session, maybe in isolation, maybe acutely that day, I get to take my frustrations out on that. But like long-term, like that's when things are the least predictable. And, and historically, man, like every injury I've had, like when I think about it, when I look at the background noise, it's like, that's the one thing that they have in common. You got a lot of other shit going on when they happen. Yeah. 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 No, that makes a ton of sense, man. Go ahead, Nick. I know this podcast is about back pain, but I'm going to develop neck pain from nodding along as much as I was to Berto. Um, I, I, when I became a dad, the dad jokes just got worse Can you show us where the neck is on that <laughs> spine? No. <laughs> it's basically like the lower back, except a little bit smaller. Got it. Um, yeah, that was, uh, Berto, that was awesome. Um, I think one of the things that that made me think of was this fear of movement that typically happens. Um, fear of variety of movement. Um, one of the pieces that I left out in my story was that, so I, I talked about the things I did in the gym and the things that I did actively to try to help it. Uh, I didn't talk about my daily life. So I was living my life contracting my transverse abdominis and fearing any kind of movement that, that I wasn't able to completely control. Um, I wanted to walk around like <laughs> the model skeleton and not bend my spine and just kind of hinge at my hips for my whole life. And I would bend down and pick things up off the floor in, in, a, in like a, a deep squat, <laughs> like a goblet squat. <laughs> Um, I would, uh, sit with, um, a lumbar support in my car and in my chair at work or at my chair at home, because I didn't want to fall into flexion and then pop my jelly out of my disc and then hit my nerve. Um, again, all examples of how the narrative and the paradigm or the map that you use to ap approach this condition can impact the actual response and what you do and sometimes it's not 
so much what you're doing. It's, it's, it's how you're looking at the situation. Mm. It's interesting to me how the narratives change over time too. Like, um, I jokingly mentioned Kelly Starrett earlier and his was all about like being the body mechanic. It was very proactive. Like, here's the things you need to do for these things, you know, uh, you know, like I think one, one positive aspect while I think in hindsight, I don't necessarily think a lot of what he recommended really made a lot of sense was there was always something to do. It it gave you a sense Mm -hmm. of empowerment Mm -hmm. and it wasn't movement phobic by any means. Um, and I don't think he offered many things that were just like, Oh wow, that was really harmful in, in retrospect. But I think, you know, like before that we had um who's still around and and don't get me wrong, I think from a research perspective, there's some value there. I'm not trying to take shots at anybody, like kind of the the McGill big three and just the the Stu McGill research in general that is looking at, you know, isolated mechanistic models of spines and sometimes in, you know, quadruped animals and stuff like that. But the kind of the message there is like we have a limited number of flexion cycles before things get worse. And it's just kind of the slow degeneration of a mechanical system from doing, you know, flexion. So as as much as you can, don't be in flexion. And, you know, here's very few things you can do, but it like there, it's mostly about not doing things from kind of that era, which is, which is interesting. So it's, I think they, they catch on with different people and for different reasons, like you can almost identify like the psychological disposition of someone based upon like, what stuff do they gravitate towards? You know, like if they're really, really proactive, they want to do something, uh, they're going to probably do more of the starrette style stuff. But if they're super afraid of movement and worried about hurting themselves again, uh, and they had a pretty traumatic experience, they're going to be a little more McGill, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know where I was necessarily going with that, but I do think it's important whenever you're engaging you being a listener are engaging with some of these narratives out there. Just just remember, like, I would say this is not like the supplement industry. It's not like where people are trying to get your money, pull a fast one over, and, you know, they're happy to sell stuff that doesn't work if there's a demand for it, and they'll put whatever marketing behind it is there. This is a very difficult area to know, and it is a lot of people who probably, and most in most cases, do have a genuine desire to help people. Um so I think you do have to approach people openly and with compassion because a lot of times they're coming from a place of prior trauma or current trauma, like literally I'm hurt and trying and, and, and grasping at you know, whatever straws there are to do something. Um, so one of the things that, that does sometimes bother me is that when people kind of treat this like, you know, myth bus Monday, like we're, we're going to, you know, dunk on all these, these false narratives. I don't, I don't know how helpful that is. I guess it promotes some awareness, but. I think we do have to think about where people are coming from and come at it with a little more charity and grace. I think that's a really great point. And I think what it comes down to for our followers is that not every healthcare provider is qualified to treat a weightlifter, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, every, you wouldn't take your tractor trailer to a guy who fixes Toyota Camrys, right? You would want to really go to the provider that knows how to treat those kind of, of athletes or patients. And they're not that uh, common <laughs> because our bubble of natural bodybuilding and strength sport is is a bubble within a giant uh, world. Where So um, I, I think that's probably where a lot of this misinformation comes from. It, you're going to a generalist who's going to give you the best advice that he or she can give you that that will help the most people. And when a seasoned uh, weightlifter goes into the place, they're going to get the same advice as someone who has never been in the gym before. And so that's why I think those myth bust Monday uh, attitudes kind of come about because um, no fault. Eric, like you said, it's not like they're trying to do harm or they're trying to get people in their door. I'm sure some people are, but the majority I think are not. I think it's more uh, they the the athlete should seek out someone maybe who's a bit more well versed in what they're um, interested in. And Eric, I know when you uh, talk about your hip experience with your hips, you you had to be the one to talk to your surgeon and your healthcare team and say, hey, like I get that these are the post op precautions, so do I really have to not go into the gym or can I do a hip thrust instead of a squat or can I do a knee extension instead of a a, a Romanian deadlift or something like that? Right. So you, you Mm -hmm. had that conversation with them. You opened it up to them 
and they were able to have that conversation with you and able to hang with you and they told you, well, yeah, it's actually a good point. Never thought of that because how many patients in a year are going to ask them, so I can't go to the gym, but can I hip thrust? <laughs> like, yeah. they, but you opened that conversation, you gave them the respect and you had that and, and you both probably gained from it. You gained you your ability to go back to the gym and they gained uh, some knowledge. And I know that a bit off topic, but when I was competing in my last prep in 2016, my I was uh, like many of us dealing with some blood work that was way out of whack and um, uh, testosterone being one of them. And uh, it was a, a, it was a wormy issue. Uh, uh, mm. The whole thing there uh, for any cult, cult, for any for any cult, cult listeners, just like opening a can of worms, um, okay. a bag of worms maybe, yeah, bag of worms. <laughs> yeah, like some kind of some kind of bag like uh, like a sack. round like oh, that's the word I was looking for, <laughs> like a sack of worms I was opening and going in in there. But basically, um, my uh, primary doctor referred me to an endocrinologist. The endocrinologist is used to treating middle-aged to older people with diabetes, noticed that my my blood work was how it was and immediately like wanted to put me on all this stuff. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Like I'm competing in a natural bodybuilding show. I'm, I'm consciously doing this to myself. I said, before we do anything, let me get out of this prep. Let me finish this prep. Let me put on some weight and let's revisit this later. And in the end, um, she... Uh, she she thanked me. She said, "You know, I never knew this world existed," um, and so it kind of enlightened her a little bit. And um, and so, just kind of to, to go back to the main point was um, that it's not o- always the healthcare providers that are trying to pull one over on you. Sometimes they're just not well versed in it, and that's totally fine. Yeah, and it doesn't even mean they're bad practitioners. You know, like like I think you explained it really well in the way you said, you know, you can be a a great driver with the map of the wrong city it doesn't make you a bad driver it just makes you mean have the wrong map like you can or even even a closer analogy you can have an amazing surgeon who operates in the the wrong location probably not going to be good right (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) uh so i mean yeah i i think you know the funny thing it's just uh sometimes the knowledge is so specialized too because matt brick did a great job with my surgery and he actually has a place called um that is like a sports medicine specialist but uh, i think the majority of people he'd worked with were endurance athletes but he had worked with a handful i mean talking a handful of weightlifters and then me who was like the only one who didn't just want to squat you know i was like asking about bodybuilding specific things so i mean we're talking about you know sports medicine one bubble you know, lifting weights generally another bubble and then a, a niche application of weightlifting and then also having a patient who you know, has a PhD in strength and conditioning. Like I was able to interpret where he was trying to get to. So it was a a really good collaborative experience. And I think that should be the expectation. Like there's this, we're in this tough reality now in 2021 where we've had the death of the expert, where we've got, you know, people who are trying to go online and, and, and do quote unquote research to learn about, you know, vaccines and, but, and, 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 you know, understandably getting it wrong, you know, because they're not actually virologists or immunologists. But at the same time, we don't want to just put people on a pedestal because of their their expertise. So it kind of leaves the general person in a really difficult position. And I think the the only responsible answer to that is that you need to find someone that you trust who has their credentials and then work collaboratively with them. Uh, don't put them on a pedestal, but also don't fall into that trap of thinking that you somehow know better than them. But they, if they're a healthcare professional, they of course should be taking your consideration in mind. So don't expect to find a quote unquote expert who just is perfect. You know, that's kind of, we've talked about this before, treating your coach like an appliance, you know, hey, can you guarantee me that I will lose 20 pounds or get a pro card? What can you do for me? No, nah, it's not, not the way it works in coaching. It's not the way it works in, and not the way it should work in healthcare. And the amount of input you can give is going to scale depending on your experience with your body, how much you moved and exercise. I think, you know, we're actually talking about this off camera, but Nick was explaining, and I'll let you talk about this, how it's a totally different world 
uh, working with people who have been lifting and moving and considering their recovery and their stress levels in training and in the gym and outside of the gym compared to someone who they are forced to now think about their body because it's hurt, but previously they didn't at all. So I, I don't know, Nick, if you want to talk more about that collaborative experience. Yeah, that is everything. If we had if we had a some kind of diagram with all of the moving pieces of, of recovery at the center of it, it would be that collaboration. Um, it, sometimes when we get stuck in our world or our, our silo of, of natural bodybuilding, even the most novice natural bodybuilder is leaps and bounds ahead of your average person that's going to walk into a physical therapy clinic with an experience of back pain. It is, um, so we talked about someone who maybe is more of a generalist and has to treat an athlete. For me, sometimes it's the opposite. I need to pull myself back and say, hey, maybe Mrs. Jones doesn't need to squat and deadlift. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she needs something else. Maybe she needs some uh, some lower level things. Maybe she needs some soft tissue work before we get into our strengthening. Maybe she needs um, a bit more uh, just, just education and reassurance. Um, so I think that takes me a lot longer in, with the general population uh, patient or athlete. Well, I guess not an athlete, but general population patient is that uh, it takes more time to to um, to kind of uh, get through and and help change that paradigm because these are people that have never felt a muscle burn in their life. Mm. I mean, there are cultures where the um, older women, I mean, they make they they make food and and care for children, and that's their culture, and that's what they do. And to have them, come in here with back pain and they, they are lost. Like talk about being lost and confused. They they really don't know what's going on and don't know if it's going to get better. Um, so yeah, I think I spend way more time uh, educating and reassuring and, and trying to set that foundation than with, um, than with athletes. A lot of times the athletes almost know too much and I have to mm -hmm. kind of sift through it a bit and say, okay, there's some value to that. This may not, we may, maybe we shouldn't spend as much time on this and, and kind of dive into it like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely, uh, I get a good perspective from working with both populations. That's so crazy. Yeah. Cause with the coaching, I'll get, I'll get someone who they just pop in here for a Skype consultation, for example. And they're like, Bert, you're the man. Like you just, you don't miss dude. So whatever you say is, is, is the way. So we're kind of just, both of us just like, here, just standing, staring at each other. I'm like, I don't even know where to start because I need your input. You know, like to me, it's almost easier when I have someone who, again, maybe knows too much to the point where they've convinced themselves of some pretty gnarly things over time. Cause I have their input, you know, they've tried this, tried that. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, they're, they're, if anything, they're overly insistent on like, Hey, like I want to be part of this like plan we, we develop and, and things turn out way better. Whereas like with the first individual that's just here and is like, yo, Bert, serve me up with, you know, the golden ticket. Like it takes us a few extra training blocks to like really nail everything. Um, and, and sometimes what gets us there is like their, their, their actual input. Like that's what takes us to that to that next level um but i agree man as a bodybuilder it's just made me so much more in tune because training matters like everything goes back to training but when it comes to like the way i eat the way i sleep the way i manage stress like like these are all things that i don't think i would have been as aware of at this point had it not been for you know my measuring stick um so so yeah no we're um, we're really good at whether we're, we understand exactly why it's happening or not. Just telling you what is, is it we feel. Um, mm. but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, so much more helpful when the athlete gives you their two cents and, and they don't view you as like the, Hey, you know, you're going to tell me exactly what to do and we'll be good about a month, give or take. Right. Like, no, that's, that's, that's not how it works. You're a great coach or you're a great clinician if we're talking about Nick. Hey, can you give me the cookie cutter? Because <laughs> I know Sometimes. yours is the best. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like when I, st- I feel like the expectation, uh, when they look behind like the curtain and it's like, okay, so what you're doing is you're just asking me questions and I'm going to guide my own treatment. <laughs> it's like, what are you actually doing? And I, like, I always have that fear. Like, like I hope we're not like, uh, you're not missing the fact that this is the process. Like this is how it's going to sure. work. Yeah. Um, but that's something that, especially with low back pain, something that I have to bend a little bit with, uh, spe- so not virtually, um, bend, aha, uh-huh. um, uh, not virtually of course, but if one example with, um, with my, uh, brick and mortar, uh, practice is people that come in with an expectation of getting adjusted, getting their back cracked, getting some soft tissue work on their back, because that's a narrative they're coming in with. I don't mind doing that if it's an entryway into getting to know them or having them be more compliant with the the more important and, and longer term uh, uh, solutions, I guess, uh, progressive loading and things like that. Um, I won't make those things take very long. I won't make them take the bulk of the treatment. But if someone is coming in with those beliefs, I don't mind spending some time doing those things before we progressively load to kind of bring the barrier down mentally, physically, and, and, uh, and Hey, it can work in the short term. So if someone is in pain, they walk in in pain and they're they're They want to get out of pain. And I have some kind of short term pain relief that takes 30 seconds. Why not do it? If that's what they're coming in and, and believing, and then that opens a door to a therapeutic alliance and, 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 uh, you know, building that from the ground up. Um, so it's definitely important to see people where they're at and um, not just something I've learned is not just kind of dump everything on them on them at once. And, uh, you know, we, they're people and they're people with beliefs and we have to validate those beliefs and, and, and correct as we go. And honestly, it would be not only it would be ineffective for us to do otherwise, and it really comes from a place of arrogance when you think about it. You know, a story I often use is I had a bodybuilder who came to me who was eating like 400 grams of protein a day. And no, they did not weigh 300 pounds. So it was not reasonable. <laughs> okay. We're talking about a female competitor. Um, and wow. the guidance I gave them was actually, no, no, I'm sorry. It was a female competitor, but she was eating more than four grams per kilogram. Okay. Um, so it was actually in the, it was around 300 Actually, so it was still pretty. pretty it was. It was. It wasn't quite there. It was in the high two hundreds. So, I you know I would have preferred if she was closer to like one hundred and fifty grams, but I did not cut her protein in half immediately, because she's doing that for a reason, and I haven't earned that kind of trust. There's no relationship that I've formed with you for you to have any reason to to just immediately on the first time I meet you just go no that's wrong do this you know so you know what makes sense is to to start with developing a relationship and figure out where the entry point was so the first thing i did is we you know we took it down to like 225 and i said you know i'm inter- you know yeah protein's important it's great and i understand why you're eating a lot um you know high protein diets you know in, in the published research most of the highest recommendations have helms behind them so no i'm, I'm there with you uh, however i think you might be able to perform better if we had a little more calories from from carbs and fat to get some fuel in there and you might you know find that diet went better let's see how things go with replacing you know 50 grams of of protein with 50 grams of carbs and just see how it goes Um, and then from there when we found that there was no negative downside and actually some positives okay now we've got a relationship and also i've taught and all the other things that i'm doing currently it's not just about trying to adjust for protein and eventually did get her down to a number that started with one you know, uh, and, and to their, to their benefit. But that same recommendation, I want you to eat X amount of protein given initially would have truly been a thing of, of arrogance on my part and it would not have worked. So I think that's something we, we, that, that it, uh, is a, is a point that I just wanted to reemphasize, even though you basically just said that Nick, that you shouldn't expect to just be able to give someone what is optimal on paper immediately when it is, and when you're operating in the, within that Venn diagram where the whole outside bubble is collaboration and building a relationship. Um, and yeah, sometimes you're going to get people who come to you and like, hey, I trust you. Tell me what to do. Um, and 
you better hope that the answer is, well, I need to know more about you to do that. Or hell, you could just read their book, you know, like if someone comes to me and wants that kind of Skype consultation, I'm like, here's a link to my videos. <laughs> you know, you can, you can watch me in an S3 quality. That's the only downside to not doing it on Skype. Um, but yeah, obviously the individualization is critical. Um, so I'm starting to summarize what you guys have said. So I'm going to do an attempt to summarize what I think are some of the key points more intentionally. And then I want to like, you know, peer review with, with y'all too, if I got it all. So I think the first thing is um, that I got from both of what you were saying, Berto, and what you were saying, Nick, is that you want someone in your corner. There, someone who has experience, who can be objective. Um, you know, it might have sounded like a coaching commercial and Berto brought it up earlier. And hopefully we have one of those, you know, midpoint 3DMJ coaching things are open right now and you can hear us talk about it. But uh, <laughs> I, the reason why Berto brought up that athletes get hurt a lot less when they work with coaches is just because you have someone to objectively give you another opinion on what you're doing. And if, you know, you're an athlete, you tend to, to on average, trend towards doing too much, erring on the side of, of working harder. Um, but if you're already well into the realm of not having a great compatibility between your level of recovery and your level of stress, that might leave you in an environment where these things are more likely to happen. Um, and I would say the same thing, like, like, like you said, Nick, uh, you want to have someone who can develop a collaborative relationship with you, um, someone who also is qualified to work with a lifter in, in the healthcare area. Uh, another really important thing is just to be aware of the regression to the mean. Anytime you're seeing these potential things out there and you're seeing anecdotes uh, that seem to even sometimes conflict, just remember that most of the time back pain does get better. So are these people... Do they really find the secret that's going to apply to that same situation for you? Um, is it even really the same situation, even though it's the same region? There's a lot of stuff going on back there. We saw the spine, folks. Uh, so <laughs> consider regression to the mean. Um, and yeah, I think another one is just the psychological response to the injury itself. Uh, it is not uncommon at all to have the same experience Berto had, where you find yourself considering, who will I be without being able to do this thing? that I now cannot do or believe I cannot do. Um, and just trying to not let the injury compound with your fears and the stories you tell yourself and the potential behaviors that come from it, like Nick's experience where it became either movement phobic or maybe hyper movement oriented where you're doing too much. I think those are all very, very common things. And that's a lot to manage on your own. So I can understand that that's intimidating. Um, but I know for me, I'm very grateful to have Nick on the team for very selfish reasons because he knows when he gets a random message from me uh, at a strange time uh, on a platform I normally don't contact him with um, that that I probably got an ouchie in the gym and I need someone to, to, to help calm me down and give me some direction so that I don't go down one of those incorrect pathways. And uh, I just appreciate that. So um, I recommend everyone get the equivalent of a Nick in your life. Eric, it's like the bat phone. <laughs> when 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 it goes off, oh, it's just that's that's <laughs> no matter what's going on. Drop the baby, drop this, bang. We got we got to focus here, ladies and gentlemen. We got to we got to get to action. Eric comes, needs me. Baby dropped, and we're gonna deal with this minor injury that Eric is freaking out about. <laughs> you have a grade one bicep um, strain. Don't worry, Eric. I got you. Here's what you need to do. <laughs> Nothing. Wait a week. <laughs> yeah, I rush. I rush to answer you, and I say, "Eric, how does it make you feel that that happened?" <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I think that was a good summary. Uh, I think what I would like to maybe just leave everyone with is um, is just some like practical, like, "Hey, you have back pain. Like, how do I rule out red flags? Where do I go from here? Like, uh, you know, what does it actually all mean?" Um, so you develop some back pain. Some red flags you want to look at are, um, so was there some kind of mechanism of injury or did this thing just kind of gradually creep up on you? Um, is it constant or does it come and go? Can you reproduce it? Can you make it worse? So that pain that's, that's constant, that kind of wakes you up at nighttime, that's what I would consider a red flag. And the definition of a red flag for me is not like we need to go to the emergency room right now. It's, we need to get this checked out by a healthcare provider. Um, another would be persistent numbness and tingling down the leg, uh, loss of bowel or bladder control. All of those things, uh, fever, 
anything like that, um, those things would be things that I would want someone to go see a qualified healthcare provider for. Numbness and tingling isn't always one because it, there are strategies we can do with rest and, and training modifications to help with that. But if, it, if it's persistent, if you're noticing weakness in your legs, um, if your legs giving out from under you, those are reasons why you'd want to go seek someone out. Um, as far as training and what we should do to um, kind of modify or work around this pain, back pain specifically is is interesting because I guess like all pain, um, there is so there is a protective effect of movement and exercise. We can also overdo it. So sometimes we want to keep gradually exposing ourselves to a movement to kind of desensitize that pain response. Other times we want to, um, other times we want to maybe back off a little bit and not keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And maybe we want to back off and kind of let that thing rest and recover uh, a bit. So Eric, like you were saying before, there's kind of those two camps where it's, I want to do more, do more, do more, and then, uh, and, and, and move in different planes and more movement and more movement. And then there's the other one where it's a bit more like, maybe we shouldn't move. Maybe we should do these basic exercises and kind of load it within this comfortable range. And I think those are probably two ends of a spectrum. And I think there's utility to both of them at different times. And it's not up to you, the listener to figure that out on your own. That's why I exist. That's why others like me exist. Um, so, uh, not going to go down like the rabbit hole of pain and graded exposure. Like we have plenty of, of, you know, other content on that. So be sure to check that out. Cause that is the crux of, of all of this. Um, so if you have low back pain, like, like Eric said, don't, don't fret, um, most likely not something dangerous, it, although it can be quite intense and quite life altering. Um, there are ways through and you will become better. Uh, in the gym, better outside the gym uh, because of it. And that that's the goal. And I'm here to help. We're here to help. And uh, we, you have a support system uh, here. So uh, I guess we'll wrap it up uh, there. Uh, thank you everybody for listening to this episode of the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. And we'll see you next time. What's going on 3D MJers? Eric Helms here. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I just want to take a second to tell you about Mass, Monthly Applications and Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I put out with Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Dr. Eric Trexler, where we cover the most up-to-date, peer-reviewed research in the world of strength and physique sport that's directly relevant to your practice as a coach or an athlete. We provide our reviews in written format, but also, since you enjoy our podcast, in audio roundtable reviews where we discuss the research in depth. Finally, we also do video concept reviews where we cover a broader topic in video format for your learning. For fitness professionals, you can take quizzes on mass content and earn continuing education credits for most of the biggest certifying bodies in the fitness industry. If you want to sign up and get a subscription, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com and click on the products tab. Thanks for your time and thanks for listening.